What up, what up, what up, what up? Monday morning. Monday is a Monday is a Monday. Oh, what a weekend. All right. Um, well, we only have five people that's including me in the uh, chat here. Let me uh, rev up the old Instagram live, see if I can send some notifications out to peeps. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to go into my Instagram account for the class. And I will absolutely get people awake and ready to go. Like I said, a beautiful Monday morning. And we go. I'm gonna get those people going for now. In the meantime, uh, for you guys that are here, you guys that are here, um, we did a few things at the end of last week, and then a couple of things popped out. Um, let's see. Well, we took the quiz, obviously. Um, and I posted something about the gym. So, uh, Karina, make sure that you, um, download gym book 4A, which is right here on my screen. Um, right now, uh, it is, hold on, I'm going to switch over my Wi-Fi just for one second. I don't think I lost anybody, which is good. There we go. So like I said, yeah, we, um, we posted a few things. Uh, by the way, Karina, again, your gym book 4A is up there. Just record your answers on a piece of paper. And then uh, Mrs. Caraciola um, sent an email out to us, reminding us uh, to... When you're done, take a picture of it and email it to her at wsbosis.org. Please make sure you're keeping up with this. You cannot graduate high school without gym. <laughs> uh, so there we go. Uh, what else did we do? Um, so on Friday, we took the test. And as I was watching uh, test submissions come in, I was able to see uh, people answer, yes, time for class, DJ Tony Pre. Um, but yes, I, um, I saw some of the results coming in the issue on my end, and I've never done a quiz through a virtual portal here, um, is that I couldn't find out who was who I was getting responses, but I wasn't getting your email or your account information attached to those responses. So what had happened was, and what I did just to be sure we were staying um, afloat here. I, I kind of did some research on uh, Friday afternoon and Saturday in regards to how to kind of link those submissions to your name. And I did get one result. I think Kim, Kim, you were the only one to do it. Um, I unmuted you for a second, Kim. Tell me about your um, experience. What did you do to get your test back to me assigned with your email address? Uh, well, I just, there was like a new form, so I just re rewrote my, my Gmail on the, on the form. Okay, now when you did that, was your old test still there when I returned it to you, or was it a blank test? No, I, I had to do it all over again. You had to do the 20 questions all over again? Yeah. Okay, um, and you did that, which was great. So I then um, went back and returned everyone's test to them. So here's what I'd like you to do today. When we're done here, I'd like you to all go back into your Google Classroom and I'd like you to make sure this time you write down your email address. So let me just show you what I'm talking about. On my screen, um, when you go into your quiz and I'm gonna do it like I'm a student, right? You see that there's an email address here. So you have to fill in that email address in order to um, let's see, to make sure you're assigning your test to your account. And that was what I found out. I did not know that. I thought just because you were taking it under your account and submitting it, it would just send it in. So what I was seeing was responses, which was fine. Um, let me see, instructions. Uh, that's not where I was. Back out a little bit really quick. Uh, go into it. 
what, oh, here, watch. So I go into this and then I can edit it and then I can see responses, right? So when I go into an individual response, I just see it as response number one. I don't see it as you specifically. So you can see it's just a bunch of responses until Kim, thank you very much, um, sent it back with her email address. Now I'm assuming right here, this one is Vince because he was the other one that resubmitted it. Um, and I'm pretty sure if we get him uh, unmuted here, he'll probably tell us the same thing that he had to retake it. So that way I can kind of see and go through and score this. Now, the other thing, what I was seeing, which was cool, was I was seeing charted responses to what was going on. So let me just go back in here for a second and see the summary. So I could see, um, you know, the average test, I could see which ones. And so this was the live stuff I was getting back while you guys were taking the test. Um, so I just wanted to show you what I was seeing on my end. Like I said, I did some research before we gave the test. I thought I had all the settings correct. Apparently I did not. So uh, I returned it back to you. Make sure you go back and um, this time put in your email address and then go back through your answers again. So for instance, yeah, Kim, congratulations, you got a 90, right? So I gave that back to Kim. But then I also was getting this, which was kind of cool, seeing you know who got what question right and the percentages of people in the class, whether it was a good question, a bad question, which was kind of cool. Um, but I wasn't getting names attached to it, and that was my problem. So as I was supposed to be seeing your names like you see here, um, I should have gotten grades for that, but I did not. All right, so here's what I did again. Um, oh, uh, people want the code for the gym, by, for the thing, it's right here, by the way. If anyone's looking for it, it's on April 3rd, as I mentioned. The new code will be posted either Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, so go back and look um, for the code that's in our feed. I'll say it again when Ryan shows up, just to be sure everyone knows. And that way he can see it. Uh, and there we go. So uh, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, you know, like I said, it's one of those things where we're just trying to figure this all out. Um, I never used Google Classroom to this level. I've used it before. Hence the reason why I was up and running before a lot of students or a lot of teachers were in other classes. I don't know if you talked to anybody in other tech programs, but we were up and running very, very quickly compared to the other ones. And then we slowly integrated into the Google Classroom uh, to figure out what exactly was working. All right. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. And again, classwork is always found in the classwork tab. So please make sure that you are checking out your classwork tab. Also in the stream, you'll see that there's a new project, which we just assigned. So make sure that you, of course, um, check out your assignments. And we'll go back through this feed again. I'm gonna take down the Instagram account, it's just easier. I'm not going as fast. And now, video, congratulations, okay. So there we go. Um, so there it was, right? Uh, we tried to take the test. It didn't quite work out the way I wanted it to. So hopefully you guys are able to send back the test this time with your email address attached to it so I can give you credit for the test you took. Um, for the most part, the average, although you saw um, the average in here, it wasn't that average because I did not assign a grade to it. I wanted to manually go through them and check them myself. So I just don't know who to assign the grade to. <laughs> That was the difference. Um, so it looks like 16 of you took the test. Uh, I saw individual tests, please resubmit to make sure you enter your email address used for this Google Classroom. So whatever you use to log into this Google Classroom, make sure you're using the same Google address, all right? That's where we're at right now before we get into today and this week's work. Anybody have any questions about the test itself? before we move on. Anyone want something cleared up? Um, anything about that? Blah, 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 blah. Give you a minute to catch me in a delay and ask your questions or forever hold your peace. I guess forever hold your peace is the answer today. Awesome. Uh, again, uh, all the new codes, all the new stuff, I'll post either Friday uh, after our class, which I did right here, or of course, 
sometime during the weekend. So whenever you get a chance, make sure you check into the Google Classroom. Check the stream Monday morning to see what the new Zoom ID will be. And welcome everybody to audio production on a Monday morning. Good times, good things, good happenings. All right. Um, let's do what we normally do on Mondays where we have new assignments, shall we? Let's go in and take a look at the brand new project number nine. Uh, nope, not there. Uh, we'll just click on it in here. Wow, uh, it takes me to the same stupid place. All right, so we'll go into this one. So in this project, what I did was uh, I found this really cool master class. And when you start watching it, you'll realize why I do like it. Um, the guy's voice, I believe, is from Britain, and people with British accents uh, I can listen to all day. Some people find it annoying. I find it very intriguing, and uh, they sound very intellectual. Usually, they're equally as intellectual as anyone over here in America, but with their accent, it makes them sound so much more intellectual. And for me, just to listen to it, it's not something you hear every day, so it kind of stimulates my auditory senses. All right, so in this project, you're going to be watching this live masterclass that was done in front of a live um, auditorium. And by masterclass, I mean, yes, it is a much uh, higher level class than we will probably end up doing. But, but, mind you, but, there are some things in this that um, are going to apply to the things that we're going to be doing for the next few weeks. So what I want you to do is start watching, listening, trying to understand, knowing you probably won't fully, but coming up with questions. Really, the biggest part of this project isn't just a summary of what you found out or what you don't understand. It's the questions that you're going to ask. And I want to be able to answer them as best I can during our live lessons. So let's take a look at the top sheet, and I kind of outlined it here in the thing, but let's take a look at the Project 9 top sheet, okay? So uh, in the link that I provided to you in the project, you're going to be watching the live broadcast of the masterclass. Throughout the week, you'll watch and summarize 15-minute blocks of video. You're not watching an hour, and I think this is 14 to 15 minutes straight off the bat. You're not doing that. You're watching it in 15-minute sections, so stop yourself 15 minutes in. On Tuesday, stop yourself 30 minutes in. On Wednesday, 45. On Thursday, one hour. And you can go rewatch it and just keep watching it over and over again. Um, here's what I want you to do. You want to write down your findings, discuss your level of understanding. And the most important part to me was the pose questions that we can answer live on our sessions. All right, so below on this top sheet, I gave you five days to summarize, to discuss, and to pose two questions. All right, so here are the sheets that you're going to have to do. So this is the Project 9 top sheet. Uh, today, you will start watching this video. It is dated for you, so you don't have to date it. You can write your quick summary, nothing crazy. You're only watching, like I said, you're only watching um, 15 minutes at a time, so not that big of a deal. So if every 15 minutes, stop and then summarize what you heard. Um, write down things that you did know or things that you didn't know. And by doing those two things, you should be able to come up with two questions to ask. Questions that we can answer here in our live videos. So again, you're gonna watch the masterclass video. It's about an hour and 14 minutes long, but you're only watching it 15 minute blocks each day. You're going to summarize, you're going to write what you know and you don't know, and you're going to pose two questions. And as we go through this throughout the week, by Friday, we should have a whole bunch of questions that you guys have about the stuff that's happening in this masterclass about logic. You might find things that you never knew before, stuff that even as a second year student, we never even covered before. But we do have an opportunity now, more so than we do during class, to really break down some of these very specific um, processes and in-depth logic type of, of um, uses. So I really wanna do that because I think it'll, as much as we can't use it, most of us can't use logic every day, but we can gain a better understanding for what its capability is through watching this video and kind of processing and analyzing. And like I said, the biggest part of this, not the only thing you have to do, but the biggest part of this for us is gonna be those questions that you're going to ask. 
So below are five days you will complete each day with a summary discussing your understanding and posing two questions about what you saw or about something that would follow what you saw. Um, this will be accepted either as a handwritten, a typed document, everyone should have a copy or be able to make a copy of this, or wait for it, audio summaries. So if you want to take on the next level of continually recording yourself, like I said, you could for project 8C or 8D, if you want to actually take it to the next level and record yourself, you should talk about your summary, you should talk about what you know or didn't know, and then you should be able to pose questions to ask in your audio summary. I don't care which way you do it. You can handwrite it, you can type it, or you can record yourself every day doing what this is. Um, all those submissions need to be put back into the Google Classroom. So obviously you would just hit submit uh, when you're done. Uh, you don't have to do it every day. You can do it on Friday. Um, I don't need them done every day. But yes, this is the new assignment. Uh, we're gonna classify this as Logic Pro X 102. Uh, it's the next set of training information. And by the way, just to give you a heads up, if you watch this Logic Pro X Masterclass, a lot of it is electronic music, which is where we kind of kick off today. It's not just learning about the parts and the pieces and all that stuff that we've done now. It's starting to learn how to create electronic music, edit MIDI, work with MIDI, stuff like that. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, before I move on to that part of the lesson today, does anybody have any questions about Project 9 Logic Pro Masterclass? No, your connection is not broken. I'm waiting for anyone if anyone has questions. We will move on in just a minute. Yes, Vince, what's up, buddy? So if I don't understand anything from like last week, should I just go back and watch the YouTube videos? Um, what do you mean you didn't understand anything from last week? The the stuff that was on the test or are you talking about just doing yeah. it? Yeah, some of the stuff on the test. So what um which email did you use, by the way? Just to give me a heads up on did you retake the test today? I I asked you a question. I asked you a question about that do i have to retake it and submit it you um, said yeah. yeah you came into the chat late today um but basically the quiz um as i was doing the document uh for some reason um didn't have um your email address in there like it should have so what happened was when i was getting responses i'm going to show you this if you're watching on your screen when i was getting responses um my individual responses look like this See, it just says response one, response two. It doesn't have an email address. I don't know who you are. So I have no way of attaching a grade to anybody. So I sent it back out to everyone and told you to write in your email address. And there are three of you now. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Rip Toxic Link. And thanks, Kim, uh, for sending it back. So now I have the ability to grade it and attach your name to it. All okay. right. You see how that works? Uh, Kim told us at the beginning of the lesson today that she had to redo the test, yes. She had to go back through the 20 questions, but I returned it to everybody. So you should be able to go back in there and put back in your responses. To answer your question specifically, if you don't understand anything from last week or you think you had trouble with the quiz, yeah, you're gonna have to go back and watch our lessons again um, that are on YouTube. Uh, I would definitely watch some of those videos of the links I sent you from um, our cl Google Classroom. And just kind of, unfortunately, you don't have the software in front of you, but as long as you can sit and watch and kind of process and even do what we're doing for Project 9, um, write down a summary of what you're finding out and then pose a couple of questions, absolutely. I mean, the posing of the questions is the most important part of this moving forward, is any questions you have, you need to ask. So when we keep going, I basically think that everyone gets it. And Vince, don't ever be afraid to not ask a question here on the classroom in the live sessions, because I will absolutely go through it every single time. Okay. Cool. All right. So yeah, just, just go back in and return that um, when you get a chance after the lesson today. You don't have to do it right now. After the lesson today, just make sure you go back in and... Uh, type in your email address so I know that it connects it to you. 
Okay. Cool. Thanks. All right. Uh, let's do some logic questions. Uh, actually, anybody else have a question about anything? The test, the project, anything like that? I know there were some people late to the uh, lesson today. I have a question. Go for it. Um, for the gym. Yes. Um, is it due every week? I don't think she's going to care. I'm going to say if you do it every week, it's probably best to just spread it all out. You know, when we do a chapter a week, it makes it less intense. And um, I don't know, I just find that to be a decent amount of time to complete, what, 30 to 50 questions of reading comprehension. If you want to wait, you can wait, but don't forget about it because she's going to start sending out stuff in Remind. She's going to start asking for things. I'll just say it like this. The sooner you get it done, the better. Then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Okay. All right. What else? Anybody else? You guys are pretty good at unmuting yourself and then muting yourself back up. I appreciate that. So I don't have to do any more of that muting nonsense. Uh, what is Ryan trying to tell me today? Let's see. Ryan just texted me or DM'd me, really. Let's find out what he has. What's the Zoom code? Hey, buddy, I uh, sent it to you. Uh, let's see what it is. The Zoom code today, folks, is in the Google Classroom stream, 836. I sent this to him already, though. 300, 520. It'll be that way all week long. I think he's having trouble getting in here. Or I am in a delay, because I don't know. I don't see Ryan in here, so. All right, anyway, anybody else with a question about the project of the quiz? Or Jim, for that matter. Anybody else? Anybody else? Remember, posing questions is the only way you're going to get the information you might need. Probably have a question. It's not going to... Yes, see, Ryan is in there. Hey, Ryan, what up? Uh, just a heads up, Ryan, uh, really quick. Hold on, wait for him to fully enter the thing. Okay, you're there. Ryan, uh, so here's the deal. Uh, every week, that uh, code that you were looking for, Ryan, will be in the Google Classroom. So if you look down here on Friday, April 3rd, I actually posted next week's Zoom code. So if you're ever questioning about where that Zoom code is or what it is, just go to the feed. I'll put it in the stream. And it's the same all week, but it will change each week. All right? And I put it in here as well for you, just so you guys know. All right, and just to, again, quickly summarize, I sent back the test to you. This time you'll have to submit it with your email address, so please make sure after the lesson today you resubmit your test with the email address, because I have no way of knowing who you were and what test you took. That's the way Google Classroom works. I had no idea. Um, as much research as I did, it didn't tell me to do that. Uh, number two, uh, Logic Pro 9, project number nine, rather. Uh, project number nine is posted. Please review that. It's basically watching a masterclass and filling out summary sheets, but the biggest part of that is to pose questions. Questions are very, very important. Okay, moving on. Now that we have all that done, um, let's go into logic and let's do some MIDI work because that's what we're gonna be working on today. So the first thing um, I'm gonna show you really quick, and as you may or may not know, I'm just gonna go to a new project and start an empty one, is uh, I'm gonna stop my share. Uh, do, 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 do. Very quickly, go into me. Hi, me. Dun, 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 dun. I'm just gonna. Do, 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 do. I think everyone can see me now, right? Uh, 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 there I am. Hi, how are you? Now I can see me. Um, very quickly, as we recall, I have my little nano key here. This is the Korg Nano Key Two. Uh, it is a MIDI controller using USB. Right before the lesson today, I had to go scramble to find where I put my USB. This isn't the right one, but it's just a standard uh, USB cord connection into a USB A. So I wanted to just show you that before we uh, move along. Okay, we're back into, let me screen share this and just say share, share, share. And there we go. We're back to sharing my screen. Um, so what we're going to do today is just take you from the start of a MIDI setup. Uh, what we're going to do is, first of all, start a software instrument track, so new software instrument track, or Command-Option-N will bring you the new track window. 
in which you would pick software instrument. We can move pretty fast now because we know what the library does. It gives us patches, gives us patches old hula hand. And we can go ahead and select one of the many sounds Logic Pro can generate for us. In this case, a drum kit, whereas if I So there's my drum kit I had to octave down just to get my kick and snare. And so I picked the Brooklyn kit. Uh, I can pick any one of these kits or I can go into the producer kits. That's something we learned about last week as well. Um, one of the other cool little tight kits is this one. So let's talk a little bit about MIDI recording. We set up our track, we picked our um, patch, and now we're ready to record. So how do I want to record? And that's the biggest question. Um, am I good at playing MIDI? Can I play a full-on drum kit? Can I do that live? Am I capable of playing a drum kit um, in MIDI? Am I capable of keeping time? For instance, my click. Am I capable of keeping up with that? You can see that I could create some sort of drum beat to my click. I'm capable of that. It may take a little bit of practice, but I can do it. Now, if you can't, have no fear. You don't really need to have all this uh, crazy amount of musical ability in order to create basic things in Logic. Let's first talk about what it takes to record MIDI. All right, very simply, select your track, select your patch, hit record, and play. Right? Simple. Very easy. And people might say, well, it's not that simple. Yeah, it does take practice to kind of get it right on uh, time, right on the click. Let's see how well I did without the click. It's not bad. Um, there are ways that we can make it better. But right off the bat, I'm good with what I got there. Let's do this. Let's um, loop that using my cycle. All right, I might have to add a few more notes down here at the bottom. So if I double click on it, I bring up my MIDI editor, which is a fun one. We're gonna talk a lot about how to create patterns and do stuff in here this week. Very simply before I discuss anything, remember this piano roll, this MIDI editor has its own set of tools. Okay, so if I hit T down here, T, I have a different set of tools than I did when I went T up here, right? T up here is a little different. This has where the fade is and the flex tool and stuff like that. That set of tools just doesn't exist down here. There it goes. That set of tools doesn't exist down here. Down here, I have things like the quantize tool, a velocity tool, a brush tool. These are very strange kind of tools that we'll have to learn about as we go along. So again, some of the basic editing stuff that we learn up here in the edit window is going to apply down here in the MIDI window, but we just have to find out what the difference is and the changes are. Of course, in my MIDI window, you can see that I have a whole new set of stuff here. Let's talk about that stuff. Um, of course, we have our quick uh, directions to our menu items. So edit, of course, is just editing type of uh, menu options. We have functions, which is a definite change from the functions that we had up here in the edit window. All right, this one is a very specific things like quantization information, sustaining, uh, controller voices, insert instrument, uh, and of course my MIDI transform, which I use a lot. We will talk about this this week. Uh, basic view changes up here, very easy. Um, we could do drum names and note labels, uh, which is again, very specific to this window, which is cool. Uh, let's take a look at what this stuff is. 
Um, this is the collapse mode. So take a look at this. This I found very useful, okay? So now let's take a look at our edit window for a moment here, right? We have all these uh, assigned, let's say, pieces of a kit, right? They're assigned pieces of a kit. And they all correspond to notes on my piano, right? So I can, ooh, here's my tambourine, right? And if I go down from there, I got my ride bell, I got my ride edge, I got my ride out. And you can see that that is all labeled here. But let's say I'm not using any of those. I don't, I'm not using any of these. And it looks really crazy to have these tiny little MIDI notes um, up here in the window with all this other stuff that's unnecessary. So collapse view will actually reduce you down to just the instruments you played. Now I find this very, very helpful. I am constantly using this part of the, um, the view down here. It, it's, it's extremely helpful, extremely helpful. All right, uh, highly recommend this particular way of editing is just simplify your workflow. Get rid of the things you're not using without destroying it, obviously, and be able to now go in and edit specific parts of your project. And I'm just gonna quickly create some pencil tool information here. And then I'm gonna be able to draw in pencil tool information. Oh, too close. There we go. And there we go. And we'll do a kick here. When does the kick happen? Let's see, we got the loop on, sorry. And there we go. We basically have our four bar loop now. I just had to create two more hi-hat hits and we'll get into how to do that later throughout the week. All right, um, what else do we have here? We have our MIDI draw, which is very interesting. We talked about creating automation for tracks up here in the edit window. So MIDI draw is kind of like that in that we're going to be able to change individual note information. So in this case, if you remember in Pro Tools, we had these stalks that were up and down. And in this one, we have things like note velocity for your controller information or any of these other types of data that can be changed down here in the MIDI draw. So I can change my pitch bending, my breathing, sustaining volume, um, which, by the way, would be velocity in the end. Um, and I could also, of course, change it for any other of these particular symbols. So um, I don't particularly go into MIDI draw editing until way after I'm done. But you could see down here that this note is obviously much louder than this note. So I might want to maybe make a little more consistent pattern of this to make it sound a little more, mm, I don't know, um, you know, uh, I don't want to say synthesized, but more robotic. Not always do I want something robotic, but yeah, I, sometimes I do to make it just simple and smooth. So my collapse view, again, showing me less of those instruments that I did not use. MIDI draw, basically opening up this um, rewritable data information about the MIDI. What else can we hear here? Uh, we have MIDI in and MIDI out. These allow me to hear signals coming in and out. Of course, I want to hear the signal coming out. Right, and now with MIDI information in, I can also hear stuff from my controller. Of course, you know you have your catch playhead, the same thing that happened up here is the same thing that happened down here. And the other thing is this link. So the link actually becomes more important when you're doing looping and when you are doing multiple clips across different uh, tracks. I'll explain that more throughout the week and how that really becomes relevant, um, especially when you're creating a loop and then you want the next loop to be a little different with a little more variation, you can unlink them so it doesn't change it for all, it only changes it for one. Of course, our tools, great tools. Uh, like I said, you could pop them up anywhere down here in the MIDI editor uh, or the piano roll. And uh, these tools are different than the ones up in the edit window, both primary and secondary. Secondary can be activated with the command button. All the questions on the test. Um, our smart snap. Oh, look at that. We have snapping down here as well. So interesting that we don't have particularly a grid mode, but smart snap allows us to snap them to grid lines depending on our zoom level. 
yet another question that was on the test on Friday. Now, why did I pose that question on Friday? Well, because um, zooming in allows me to take this and get it to click or snap right to that grid line. That's important. You want to be able to do that in MIDI. More important in MIDI than basically anything else. I mean, audio, yes, of course, with looping and start times. But with MIDI, most of the MIDI you're creating is going to be very specific to a bar or a beat. So you're going to want to make sure that you have your smart snap on and then in order to zoom in to get it to where you want it. Again, our horizontal zoom fills the whole screen with the clip and all the notes in that clip. We also do have sliders over here. Let's shift our attention to this section over here. So of course, uh, we have this global track for the MIDI. Same thing that was up here, right? You can see the arrangement, the marker, the signature, the tempo. Same thing down here, but very specifically just for this track and just for this clip. Now, the big one that everyone loves is quantization. Now let's talk about timing, quantizing, scaling, quantizing, that kind of stuff. First of all, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna highlight all of the notes. How did I do that? I clicked in an empty section right here, just did a click and hit Command A to select all. And there it is. Now that I have all these selected, anything that I do over here will be applied to all of them. So let's talk about it. Um, we have our quantization levels. This is very similar to Pro Tools. If you remember, quantization happens as whole note, half note, quarter note, eighth note, 16, 30 second, 64th. Same thing here in Logic, right? In order to do that, select the note that you want to quantize, go ahead and hit your quantization level, and they all shift right in line. Let's listen to my drum beat now. I mean, it's perfect. Here it was before. I just undid it. So some of the notes were ahead, some of the notes were behind. It's not perfect, as is most people's MIDI drumming. It's hard to do it perfectly in time, but that's why quantization exists, right? It's your ability to take these notes and snap them to the nearest grid line. In this case, a 1 16th grid line, which then puts them in a perfect pattern, a perfect computerized robotic pattern that now you can add to. Um, there is some things here, uh, settings for your um, quantization. The first thing is the strength of how hard it snaps to that 1 16th bar. So you could turn that down a little bit and shift things off. You could see them start to move a little bit as you can see. And then of course the swing, which randomizes which notes go to which bars and which don't. So you can really swing these ahead and behind the quantization bar, all right? Now let's talk about scaling quantization. So scaling quantization has to do with pitch and you can scale quantization in MIDI. Now, most of the time MIDI is very specific and if you go out of key, more than likely you will be able to just re or, or we'll say rectify the problem by simply dragging a note to where you want it to be. If I didn't want this note here to be at my snare, if I wanted to be a kick, all I'd have to do is drag it down and I change that. When you're getting into things like uh, horns and strings and pianos and you have a bass scale of C, you can change that scale to D or E while keeping the performance intact. That's a really cool concept here that we can change the entire scale of the project for tonal instruments right here in the scaling quantize. All right, I don't have anything scaling right now that I wanna use, but maybe when I do another track to this, um, you'll see how that works. Next, velocity. So if I click on a note, I actually have the velocity of that note shown here, and I can turn it down. If it's too loud, I'll turn it down to 113 as opposed to 127, and you see, that that note now looks like the other notes in regards to color, all right? So if I wanted to select this, and then I'm pretty sure I could select other notes that have similar quantization level, then I can select all of these red notes, like this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, get in there, and then I can turn them down as a whole, pulling them back into the same quantization scale that everything else is in. It's all in like these browns and deep brown, red, amber, mud, adobe color kind of stuff. Those reds were really 
very high um, accent marks and, and sometimes you want that and sometimes you don't. Uh, so in this case, I want it to be more consistent throughout my quick drum loop. Let's listen to it one more time. So I've basically quantized um, my notes to a scale, I'm sorry, to a grid. Uh, I haven't used the scale quantized because I don't have any tonal instruments here. And then of course I went through and just kind of leveled out any of my drum beats that were you know, highlights or accents in the velocity, making them louder than the other ones. Let's see how my loop turned out now. Pretty consistent. And very much on time. And now that I have it in a loop, I can see how that works over and over and over again. Okay, so that is just basically laying down a very simple loop in drums. And we can make changes to this later. Let's start today by adding in another instrument. Uh, so we'll do another software instrument. I did a quick uh, command option uh, N, which got me my instrument. I'm gonna pick something different, like a piano, because it's just simple. And we can do a recording of that. So I can just kind of practice my notes. Very simple, okay? So let's get into it. Let's do a recording. I have my click in, so one, two, three, four, click, and then I know I'm recording. So here we go. Okay, so four notes, all right? Um, you could see them down here. Here's my drum notes, perfectly uh, set. I can do this so you can see it better. And then my piano. And of course we know by listening, my piano is definitely not in time. So the first thing I'll do really quickly is I'll just, no, not do that. I will click down here, Command A, and quantize all of my notes. So they snap to the nearest 16th note. And I do not think it worked perfectly because you can see them snapping closer to a beat before the bars, no bueno. So here's what I'll do. I'll go ahead and highlight these guys and just reshift them over. So now they're perfectly in time. Let's hear it as a quantized value. Okay, we got ourselves some quantized information. A couple of things looking at this bottom part. These two notes right here and right here aren't that loud. So I will highlight them by themselves and I will slowly start bringing up the velocity until their color is in the same range as everything else is. Um, this is pretty good. So I don't have to worry about that. Let's hear it one more time. Now I have some more consistency. So all I did was create a basic drum beat Yes, I was practiced at that. So the recommendation is to practice it first before you do it. But even if you aren't very good at keeping time, you can definitely go in, try your best, and allow the computer to requantize it so it sounds a lot better. Sometimes if you're that far off, you'll have to make individual note changes in here, simply by taking your mouse and clicking and dragging a note somewhere, wherever it should be, or wherever it has to be. And then I took a second track, a piano track, and created another layer of just basic chords. This is a C, and then a C major, I think, or C um, major E, or C. there you go. And then I went down to a um, D on the last one there. Um, and you can see the notes over here. Take a look at that. Now, um, here's what I'll uh, do for you. I will use the scaling quantization so we'll click on our grand piano. I'll select all my notes, and you can see that I can rescale these to what I want them to be. So let's rescale them to a G major. And things happened. Things happened. Notes went missing. Let's take a look at what this is. A little different of a performance. Go backwards, let's do a different one. Let's go into, uh, let's go into A flat. 
Whoa, what the heck just happened? Let's hear what that happens. Very interesting. So there were a bunch of notes here, and I'll, I'll, I'll overexpand it so you can see. Uh, notes were shifted. Shifted notes to meet the scale of A flat. So the original one again was this. Okay, and now with a shift to A flat, and I'll do it one more time, the notes move so that they're closer and in the scale of A flat. Now they may not sound pretty, but they are definitely in the scale of A flat. And there you go, that's scale quantize. So you can actually rescale a bunch of the productions or performances you did to match certain things. If you had a piece of audio you're trying to match or another performance of MIDI you're trying to match, you can do that using the scale quantize. Again, it doesn't sound pretty because it probably doesn't include all the notes in that scale, but it is shifting notes to accommodate that scale. All right. Um, let's do one more track simply in a four bar loop. So again, command option N gives us our new track. We'll go ahead and create a new software instrument. And this time, uh, let's pick something in the orchestral area. Um, orchestral, uh, we'll pick strings and then maybe we'll pick, uh, I don't know, let's see violins too. All right, let's listen to them. So we'll do it as a half note or a half scale to this. Uh, let's do that with our warm up, and we'll hit record. And I'll do it a little higher this time. Just practicing it. Here we go. Okay, so there is our um, double speed sort of notes, uh, relatively in a pretty good range in regards to velocity. So uh, let's take a look at this. Let's quantize it up, Command A. Let's see how the quantization works here. We'll hit the Q button. And it looks like, if I can zoom in a little bit, that they're pretty good on the beats. Uh, and maybe I'll crank it up a little bit. I played the whole thing pretty soft. So let's now, while I have everything selected, crank up the velocity a little bit and turn them a little louder. All right, and there we go. So let's see how it sounds now. I have a few rogue uh, pieces over here. So maybe I'll just highlight those two and pull them down to about 114. Again, somewhere closer into the range. Um, and these guys right here, and this guy right here, I'll pull those back down into the range a little bit. There we go. So let's see it one more time. And if we let that loop travel on and on and on, we'll be able to hear, um, and again, I'll select them all. I'll take off my cycle for just a minute. And I can loop them out for, I don't know, Let's make it 16 bars, right? So there's your 16 bar chorus or verse. Um, does anyone remember, probably not, but anyone remember the quick key to turn these into real pieces of uh, a real clip? Uh, last week, I believe we talked about working with the loops library. And when you looped out a piece of audio from the loop library, um, it was grayed out, as you can see here, just like here. This, these are the originals and these are the loops. If you wanted to turn these loops into real clips, you have to go into uh, Control L. Control L will turn them all into their own loops now. So now I can go in and delete the piano part of this and the violins at the back end of this one, and maybe at the very end just have that one. There's some variation. Let's hear how this 16 bar loop sounds.
So here's what I think that we should do on this particular one. Uh, I'm going to move my piece of cycle over to this. I'm going to go ahead and go into my piano. And then I'm going to create like... Some sort of notes in there. So I have it on cycle. I have it in the area that I want. So in addition to the chords, which are, I'm just going to go in and type in some notes to kind of break it up. That's good. All right, here we go. And that's it. I just dumped in a few notes over the same clip. So this is kind of like what it was in Pro Tools for MIDI Merge. If you remember, MIDI Merge allowed me to add MIDI notes to pre-existing MIDI clips. And that's exactly what I did here. Let's go in and take a look at this clip now. I'll click on it. And down here below in the piano, you can see not only do I have my chords there, but then because I scaled up a little bit on my MIDI um, device, I have these notes here. And let's quantize them again to the 16th grid. And now they are snapped in and let's hear how it plays out. There you go. Little variation. Let's take that one and loop it out. And let's bring back in the violins at the very end. So now you have all those elements playing out. And again, to create this as its own clip, uh, control command, yeah, control L, sorry. So let's hear it one more time with all this variation I created. Nope, I don't wanna say it. Um, all this variation. So it doesn't seem like it's just a four bar loop over and over and over again. I gave it some new elements. I gave it some things that drop out, new elements that come in, and then at the end, I just summarize it all. Here it is. And you can see like I'm on to some sort of composition now. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm trying to work out how I want things to play with each other. I found that last loop, this one right here at the back end, to be probably the most musical. It has the most amount of elements. I have a, uh, a lead piano. I have the chords to support it. I had the violins in there. And if I was smart, what I probably end up doing on this particular drum loop is instead of having just the cymbal, um, start the hi-hat, sorry, start the loop, this sound, right? Maybe I make it into a, um, some sort of crash. So I'm just gonna keep dragging it up in my MIDI editor so I hear, there we go. Let's hear how that sounds. From this part on, let's see how it sounds. It's gonna sound like I start that last part with a big bang. Oh, because I did it to the wrong one. Well, that makes sense. Did it to the wrong one. Get back down there. I wanted to start the loop. Here it is. There we go. Back it up just a little bit so you can hear it. There we go. Maybe one more right here. This might actually be a good one to do. We'll accent this one. And let's see how that turned out. So just going in and making small changes to your MIDI loop, it won't affect much up here. It's great when you have your own loop, when you have a defined clip that it's its own thing. Remember hitting Control L allowed you to do that out of the loop. Uh, that actually now makes it editable on its own. And so now you can make small changes to that loop without affecting the ones that came before it um, at all.
Um, that was kind of what the link does on and off. Uh, that's something you'll have to experiment with, and we'll talk more about that when we get into more looping. But you can see that as I kind of experimented with these four sections, I actually came up with a section that I probably want to use. And so I can make and keep adding, keep creating on top of this loop. I find like this is probably the base of what I would want to use. And so then I'd expand it from here. I'd probably end up getting rid of all my experimentation stuff that I've done before that. Now that I like these three tracks together, I can also go into my mixer and start working on how the three of them are supposed to sound together. I find the piano being a, a little rough, or I find that the violin should be louder, or whatever it might be. So my mixer now allows me to go in and mix the elements together. Let's take a look at the mixer and how it reacts to my mixing. That's a little better. I like my violin to be there. And you see I'm not really peeking out over here in the master. Um, there is some church uh, reverb that's getting fed by either the piano or the Steinway. So I can add or subtract a little bit of the reverb in the mix. Um, you know, these are the types of things that you would do only after you're done creating the MIDI. Once I've created the MIDI, now I put myself into post-production mode. And that allows me now to go in and treat these tracks like they were real instruments, real recordings that allow me now to go in and of course mix them like they were and in my mixer right there. So I think that's as far as I'll go today. Again, we quickly explored this area of the MIDI editor, allowing us to quantize, allowing us to scale quantize in one way, shape or form, allowing us to change velocities. Um, we will get into uh, individual note editing a little more tomorrow and how I did some of these changes. Um, and of course, looping up here in the edit window, allowing us to loop a section and then create its own loop to a clip. And that way you can create variation in each one of these loops. We also worked with creating additional MIDI notes inside of a loop. Our basic loop of our chords now became a little grander once we added another layer of piano in there by simply going, I forget how I did it. And that's just a basic lead that if I had the loop on in the chords, I could practice over and over again. Or, I mean, I can actually just draw it in. I mean, this isn't that complicated of a um, progression here. You can just experiment piece by piece, note by note, being able to create different pieces. Again, um, this note, and this note, and this note are a little too high for an accent for me, so I'll drop them into the 108 mark. Um, -da -da. Maybe I make this one kind of accented and see how that sounded. Yeah, see, that really cuts through the mix with that emphasis on that note. So that's something I'd probably do for that one. And the key here is that note wasn't changed over in this one because it's not part of the same exact loop. It's not a loop of the original. It's just a its own clip, its own editable, changeable clip. So in order to change it again here, I grab these notes and probably drop them down to about 105, and there we go. Now I have a more consistent mix throughout. So uh, that's basic MIDI recording and editing, like very, very basic. We're gonna kind of step it up each day throughout the, uh, the week here and do more and more crazy stuff. Uh, I'm just gonna save this on the desktop. Uh, I don't think I have a test. No, I don't. TST, TST, just up. There we go. Um, so, we're going to kind of build on these skills more and more throughout the week. Before we get out of here, um, I'm wondering if anybody has uh, any questions about what we did before I close this window out and just remind you what your deal is for this week and today. Ask those questions. Also, get outside today. Go outside in your backyard. And you know, I don't care what you do. Weed the garden or dig a hole or make a fort. I don't really care. It's going to be beautiful. Get some fresh air. Just don't be around people when you do it, other than the people who you're quarantined with. What do we got, people? Questions?
about the test that you have to redo, possibly, about the project that I just assigned. And there are still lots of people who have not completed all the assignments. As you can see, uh, B, I've gotten uh, 16, I'm sorry, nine in. So P is still outstanding. Good luck with all this. Um, 11 people have turned in C. I've graded uh, at least 10 of those. So those grades might be posted in your thing. Um, and D, I got 10 in, which is great. Um, still a lot of people that need to do it. Um, but yes, 14 more people have to take it. And in this one, 13 more people have to do it. We're finally getting a lot more people into the Google Classroom. It only took a month for people to figure out that we're actually doing work. Um, but the new project again is project nine. So go ahead and explore that. And of course today, if you've gotten the quiz 21 returned to you, uh, because you didn't edit, uh, put in your email address, looks like five of you now figured it out and turned it back in. Make sure you enter your email address so I can see your name attached to your grade. Otherwise it was just some generic default response number. And I have no idea who you are. All right. Well, folks, I will see you tomorrow. Another uh, great, great day of learning MIDI in Logic Pro X. If you don't have anything else, um, we're going to be out. Last call. All right. Well, guys, enjoy your next 24, 23 hours. <laughs> and uh, like I said, get outside. O'Toole out.